is more important than a prayer you pray over food. In fact, if as a Jew you forget to pray over your food, it is a mitzvot for which you are incidentally forgiven. But if you fail to pray over the breaking of the bread of life, that is a challenge in Judaism. And I, I love the idea. I think mean, Jesus really amplified it when he said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of my mouth. In fact, there are only two actual barukas or blessings that are commanded in the Bible itself. Almost all of the other barukas or blessings are rabbinical or they've been added down through messianic circles. The only two that are required, pray before you study Torah because you are going to be consuming the bread of life which has eternal nutritional value. The bread that we eat, we pray over our meal. How many of you pray over your meal? It's okay. But I understand what Jesus said, man should not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes out of the mouth of the Lord. Thank you, Lord Jesus. So here's what would normally be said. Blessed are you, Adonai, our God, sovereign Lord of all, who hallows us with a commandment. That commandment is to engage the words of Torah. So bless us now, Lord God. Second blessing is blessed are you, Hashem, our God, King of the universe, who selected us from among all the peoples of the earth. And you gave us a great gift called the Torah. Hallelujah. Blessed are you, Hashem, giver of Torah. Bless us now as we study your word. Amen. Amen. Dr. Bill Hurst is no stranger to most of you. He's a blessing in our house. He and Sister Ellie are making arrangements. They are moving here to become a part of this Bible family. We're so excited about that. We're a, uh, it's a blessing. And uh, there's so many things I could tell you about. And let me say this. We've known each other. We were Bible <coughs> college students together. Ellie and Bill and I in a Bible college 52 years ago. Oi. Oi. <laughs> Oi. <laughs> Hallelujah. He's going to be sharing this morning from the Torah. The Torah has been blessed. Let us consume the word of the Lord as Dr. Amen. Bill shares from his heart. What God has in Thank you. On his, Thank on his you. Heart. So, welcome. Thank you, Dr. Bill. It's good to be back. And after a while, I'll be back forever. Um, Woo! Yes! <laughs> glory to God. All right. Um, Lord, focus us in this morning. Oh, yeah. Amen. Uh, this is probably one of the most important types and shadows in all of Scripture. And it's a bride for Isaac or preparing the bride. God is preparing a bride and he's looking for her. Okay? He's looking for a bride for his son. And this type of shadow is phenomenal in the depth, in the weight of it and we want to move fairly quickly because there's some points that I really feel I need to share with you and get your your mind stirred up get your spirit stirred up most of all by God's grace get you hungry Amen. Amen. and I'm not talking about that natural food <laughs> all right there were challenges in chapter 23 and we're just going to leave that up for a minute and then you can you can look at it but I want to get down to where we are there's some things Abraham had to forsake in order to be able to move forward and get ready for the next generation okay and I believe that God is on the move and the church must move forward Amen. God get us out of the stucked place we've been in for the last 80 years 
Okay? Amen. Now, only after Abraham had acknowledged that the vehicle which brought life in the past, even brought forth the promise, had died, could he move on. Only after he buried that which had been God's blessing in delivering the promise, after he buried it out of his sight, could he move on. Stop looking back. Bury it out of your sight. And only after he purchased, I call it an anchor point, in what God said was his inheritance, which was the embracing of the promises concerning inheriting the land, could he move forward. Folks, God's going to require something of you to anchor you in the new thing that he's doing. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Only after he'd done all these things could he then focus on preparing for succeeding generations. In this case, obtaining a bride for Isaac. Now many views, uh, this is the type and shadow of God's search for a bride for his son. That's why it's so important. And there's some things here that is essential to see because we think the whole church is the bride. Okay? Many have used it as such, but let's not assume we know all there is to be seen in it. First of all, Abraham is a type of Father God. Isaac's a type of Jesus Christ the Son. Eliezer is a type of the Holy Spirit. This is where we see some things about the Holy Spirit that we may not have recognized. When we see Eliezer's function throughout this whole scenario. Rebecca is a type of the bride. The family of Rebecca is a type of the church. Wow. That becomes important. Very important, by the way. Abraham called his eldest servant, who before Isaac came would have inherited everything. Yep. Genesis 15, 3. And that was a tradition of the time. But Eliezer's total focus was serving Abraham, the father nothing for himself he could have had everything are you hearing me yes but he chose to serve the father and the son his choice abraham made eliezer swear an oath you're not to take a wife for isaac from among the canaanites now some of this i'm just going to drop it on you and run <laughs> Merchandise, Canaanite means merchandisers or manipulators of or in the souls of men. And it's one of the things that Babylon is judged for in the end time. So Canaanites are around today. Okay? Second of all, he was to go to Abram's relatives and find a wife from among the cousins, Nahor, his brother's wife, family. He was not to allow Isaac to go back to Abraham's birth land. Okay? And here's the related principle in Deuteronomy 17, 16. He shall not multiply horses to himself, nor cause the people to go back to the world. I mean Egypt. Mm -hmm. We are not to go back to what we've been delivered from. Yeah. In any sense whatsoever. In this case... He wouldn't even let Isaac go halfway back. Hello? Yep. Yeah. Thou, shalt not, thou shalt take a wife of my father's relatives. Don't take my son back or allow him to go back to Haran and Nahor. Not even partway back to Ur. Don't even expose him to the mixture <laughs> there. Remember, mm. in Jacob's day, you find that Laban had teraphim. He had idols in his house, and yet he still worshiped God. We won't go there this morning. I just want to say that some of the church is in that place. That's right. Mm -hmm. That's right. Okay? Now, if she will not come, you're free of the oath. But then he gave a prophetic word. The angel of God will go before you and make your way prosperous. That's a prophetic statement. That's right. He took ten camels and goods to give to Nahor and Rebekah. Ten is the number of testing. If you are going to move on in God, guarantee you have camels. 
<laughs> Don't let the camels ride you. You ride the camels. <laughs> camels are grace testers. Of course, none of you, you, all of you are so abundant in grace, you don't have any problems. That's a Canadian thing. All right. But see here, Nahor, or Haran, is halfway back. Many people have got to the promised land and turn around and go back to Haran. They're not all the way back in Ur. We're okay. We still worship God. God is saying, don't let Isaac leave the promised land. What promise do you have from God? God's saying, hold the promise and stay moving forward. Amen. That's good. Okay, in Genesis 24, 12 to 14. This Eliezer prays, okay? Eliezer is from Damascus. Eliezer is not a Hebrew. Come on now. But he, he, here's what I want us to see. He said, O Lord God of my master Abraham. Wait a minute. Didn't Jesus call God the God of Abraham? Isaac and Jacob? He had no name in those days. O God of my master Abraham. And then slipped down. And, and he said, God, I'm putting before you a fleece. Now, he didn't call it a fleece, but is it the principle of a fleece? Let's look at the principles here. And then he, in uh, Genesis 24, 15, came to pass before he done speaking that, behold, Rebekah came out, who was born to Bethuel, son of Malchah, the wife of Nahor, Abraham's brother, with a pitcher upon her shoulder. Here's the thing that got me. I, you know, how many know that we've heard these things time and time and time again, and yet something new hits you? Okay? So this hit me, and the servant ran to meet her. Doesn't say she got all the way to the well. And if the Eliezer is a type of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit runs to meet you. He runs to meet you. Why? He knows you're called to be the bride. Not just the church, but a deeper relationship. And then another phrase that stands out. And before I'd done speaking where? He wasn't even praying out loud. He learned all this from Abraham. Hmm. A lot more about Abraham's prayer life in this than any other time we've seen, isn't there? In this portion of the record, we gain insight into Abraham's prayer life through Eliezer's actions, the power of example. Abraham was a man of prayer, all his servants, and the household knew it. This means he prayed privately as well as in front of all his family and employees or servants. <coughs> Eliezer had, had observed God answer prayer over the years because he addressed God as, O oh Lord God of my master Abraham. And as I said before, Jesus called God the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. By the way, in that, in that, that's a progressive revelation of God in those three lives. Okay? He had watched Abraham pray with his eyes open. Because he said, before I finished praying in my heart, I saw. I often say that his theme song was standing on the corner watching all the girls go by. All right. <laughs> Uh, like Gloria says, I can't help it. So, <laughs> but we need to see, we, we've got to get rid of our concepts, our religious concepts of prayer. Amen. 
And we've got to begin to see that God is in relationship. By the way, if I have a relationship with my wife, I don't need to make an appointment. Amen. <laughs> I'll leave that one right there. <laughs> She's going to hold me to it. Watch it. Uh, he watched him pray while engaged in other things. Because it says, before I had done speaking in my heart, behold, Rebecca came forth with a pitcher on her shoulder. She went down under the well and drew water, and I said unto her, Let me drink, I pray thee. He had seen God answer Abraham before the prayer was done. He had, hadn't he seen Abraham put a fleece out before the Lord and God answered? How else would he know? Hmm? These are questions that I went through. I asked myself, how did Eliezer know all this? He only had one example of prayer, Abraham. Eliezer put the fleece out, God answered. Rebekah responded, offering to water his camels as well as give him a drink. He inquired of her family and found out God had led him to the right place and it caused her to respond properly to the fleece. It reads like she was the first one he asked, doesn't it? Yeah. Again, Holy Spirit made the first move. Amen. Camels drink over 30 gallons of water at a time. That means Rebecca drew, drew 300 gallons of water out of the well. She was there a while. And depending on the size of... And by the way, you wouldn't want to wrestle with Rebecca. <laughs> if that was a five-gallon bucket. If that was a ten-gallon bucket. Or, you know, a clay pot. The clay pots in themselves were heavy. Don't wrestle with Rebecca. Don't tangle with the bride. <laughs> <clears throat> now these vehicles of grace testing that God provides for us to go the distance will seem they're insatiable, insatiably thirsty. Let the Holy Spirit teach you how to water them so you can ride them to your bridegroom. But the camels are vehicles of the Holy, that the Holy Spirit provides to ride our, to our heavenly bridegroom. Not something that rides us. She unwittingly invested in her future with a heart to serve. We've got to stop what's in it for me. She didn't know there was anything in it for her. She had a heart to serve. Now, Rebecca means, this, I like this, a rope with a noose. <laughs> The Jesenius, which goes further into the Hebrew, says the essence of her name is mean, means to ensnare with her beauty. So when people saw her, they got hung up. All right. Uh, I'm sorry. I can't tell. Now she's the focus of Eliezer. Now here's a question we need to ask ourselves. Could it be that the bride for Jesus is the focus of the Holy Spirit for this age? Before he even meets the family, he begins to share with her gifts because of her willingness to serve. <clears throat> Genesis 24, 22, he gave her a golden earring. That's half an ounce worth, about $800 today. One earring, one, not two, one. About $800 today. And he gave her two bracelets. And their weight was 10 shekels. And that's about $5,000. That's a gift without knowing, without her knowing who he is or what his purpose is. Holy Spirit is willing to invest in you. I wish we could hear that. The golden earring represents the hearing of the voice of God. She got a new level of hearing because she was willing to serve. And she got two bracelets, and I suspect it may have been one for each arm, which would mean balanced works. 
God is going to teach us how to balance all of this out, folks. The church is overboard on one or the other. Come on. Help us, Lord. He gave her the gifts before he knew who she was. Did he do it on the strength of how God had answered his fleece? Believing that if God had answered that much of it, she was the answer to the rest. Would this be an act of faith on his part? He asked her who her family was and she gave them her pedigree and Eliezer knew God had answered his request and led him to the right family. Finding it out caused him to worship, which he also had learned from Abraham. We're finding a lot about Abraham's private life with God through Eliezer. The finding of the family was an expression of mercy and truth of the God of Abraham. That's what he said. I thank you, God, that you've given mercy and truth out of my, my uh, master, Abraham. The family invited him home and were hospitable, washing his feet and the feet of his team, or washing off the dust of the journey. Listen, when you journey daily, you get dust. Your feet get dirty. Now when Jesus tried to do that for Peter, Peter wanted to fall back. And Jesus said, only your feet need washing. Why? Because daily walk picks up flesh. I mean, it picks up dust. Okay? He shared his testimony of, and how, or his journey of faith, how it brought him to them. He shared the purpose of his journey. Again, is finding a bride for the son the focus of this age? Note that her dad and brother reference some level of worship of God, showing that they represent to some measure the church realm. Yet the bride was to be taken from within or out of that realm, therefore the bride is a group within the church. The father and brother representing the church recognized this separation as being God-sourced. There will come a time in the, within the church, and this is a prophetic statement, there will come a time within the church when that realm will recognize that God is separating a people into a bride company, and although they will not respond to go themselves they'll release the Rebecca Bride Company to go to the sun, a deeper level of relationship. Yet, they will also want the company of the bride to stay with them a little longer. Why? Because they love her. But their love for her will also release her to go to her bridegroom. How many know God's got to do work in the church yet? Okay? The choice to go with the Holy Spirit into the unknown will be given to the bride company just as it was given to Rebecca to choose the time of her leaving. Note Eliezer's response, which is to worship uh, the worship of God in front of the family or in front of the church. Then Genesis 24, 53, and the servant brought forth jewels of silver, jewels of gold and raiment and gave them to Rebekah and he, also, he gave also unto her brother and to her mother precious things. Note the difference of what was given. Because she was willing to go, there was a new release of gifts, of jewels of gold and of raiment. And upon her becoming committed to become the bride, Rebekah received for the gifts silver, medal of redemption. I would say that at least it's representative of redemptive truths that were visible representations of truth worked into her by her choice to go through the process to become the bride. There are some things when you say yes to God, you're saying yes to the process. And then you say, oh God, I didn't ask for this. He said, yes, you did. God, I don't want this. Yes, you do. 
because you said yes back there. I'm not listening to a word you say. You hear what I mean? Chasten thy son while there's hope, and let not thy soul spare for a cry. He's crying. When I prayed that, God didn't listen to my complaining ever after. Some of you need to pray that, even though I warned you what's going to happen. All right. Gifts of the divine nature through accessing the promise of becoming the bride. And you can relate that directly to 2 Peter 1, 2 through 8. Add to your faith virtue and so on. The additions of God. He said you're partakers of the divine nature through the promises. I respond to a promise, there's a release. I respond to a promise, there's a release. I respond to God and he releases something new and fresh in me. And then he gave a raiment, clothing of righteousness, garments of praise, robes of salvation, robe of judgment, clothing of humility. All of them are clothing in Scripture, but most of us only have the whole armor of God in our closet. You need to get up in the morning and say, God, where are we going today? You want me to be a priest today? Can't wear armor there. Come on now. I want to get you thinking. Are you thinking yet? Amen. All right. Each of these articles of clothing are spiritual clothing in our closet that God wants to clothe us with. None of it at this time is armor. Amen. It's not that a fight is not a, or it's not a fight, but a relationship. There's a place in the development for warfare, but it's not at this time. We try and lump all these types and shadows together. Can't do that. God is a God of variety, and he has some whopping experiences for us. All right. Because they released the bride, they were given gifts as well. Are you hearing that? In other words, there's coming, as they come to the realization of this, the church is going to receive new gifting, fresh gifting, fresh anointing. Because they're willing to release those who are called to go deeper. That's covered in he also gave her brother and her mother precious things. Although they're not named, it's important to note that they were not common things. Not everybody got them. Hello? There's coming some things to the church and to the bride that the world has never seen. Why? Because we're coming to the culmination of the age. God has a plan, and by the way, it doesn't matter what I do. The question is not, is God not, is God going to do it? The question is, am I going to be in on it? My choice. It was the bride's choice. Of course, the precious things are there. I just want to uh, hit a couple of scriptures here, or uh, a couple of things here. In Psalm 49, verse 8, it talks about the redemption of the soul is precious. Psalm 126, verse 6, going forth bearing what? Precious, precious seed. Seed is precious in God. Psalm 133, verse 2, there is a, in fact, it was read this morning, wasn't it? There's a precious ointment that's to be released. An anointing that's be, to be released as the church comes into unity with the purpose of God and releases the bride. A fresh anointing is released in the church realm. Now, I just want to mention this, and we'll go quickly through this because there's a point I got to get to. Okay? Proverbs 6 and 28 says the adulteress or Babylon will hunt for the precious life. The precious life is defined in Daniel 1, 3, and 4. Babylon knows better than the church does what the precious life is. There's the list. They're all there. He calls, God calls that precious life. Babylon knows that. That's why they're after our kids. 
That's why they're after ministry. Because of the precious life that's there. Elisa wanted to turn around right away and go back, and the family wanted to delay it. The choice was given to the bride. Slip down to uh, the next <clears throat> point here. Within the bride, there's an ability to hasten the process by her choice. Doesn't take away from all that needed to be gone through to prepare, but because we choose to yield to the leading of the Holy Spirit and not resist, it shortens the time of those dealings and causes us to have union with the bridegroom sooner. Second Peter alludes to the fact that we can hasten the day. Our problem is we've set that off for the final. There's a principle in God. If, the, if there's a principle out there that the corporate can come into, there's an uh, application of it that I can come into individually. And listen, I want to hasten his coming to my life. I want to hasten the visitation and the indwelling presence of God. Okay? So it's possible that this could be the personal appearing Hebrews 9 and 28 talks about. Under those that look for him will he appear the second time again under salvation. Well, wait a minute, I'm already saved. I think that's referring to full and complete salvation. We can come there. Jesus purchased that for us. It's ours if we choose to go. Genesis 24, 57 to 59. And they called her and inquired at her mouth. Listen, I don't think it can be overemphasized. She was given the choice of time to go to her bridegroom. Mm -hmm. It was her choice. You can stay another 10 days, or we can leave immediately. I don't need 10 more days of testing. I'm going to go immediately. <laughs> she knew it was possible that she would never see her family again, but catch this. In her eyes, the going to the bridegroom preempted her love for the family or the church. She didn't know him. Let's look at this. Her choice released her and some to wait on her. And I just asked the question, it said, released to her, her nurse and some other damsels. So I wonder if there's a correlation there between Esther, which we've studied here, and Esther's seven virgins and the damsels that went with Rebecca. The choice of the bride in these days is that of being willing to leave the security of the church represented by the outer court and go into the deeper place, the holy place, she's never seen and never been to before. Her focus became looking for the bridegroom throughout the long journey. She didn't know what he looked like. She didn't know where she was going. She only had the word of the servant of the Holy Spirit. She was making this trip by faith in a promise of a bridegroom she'd never met. There are massive parallels to this, as some of you can catch. And we need the Holy Spirit to lead us into this courage. It takes courage to become part of the bride because not everybody sees it. It's not an elitism. It's a response and relationship. Genesis 24, 62 to 63. And Isaac came from the way of the well, Lari, or Lahari, for he dwelt in the south country. And Isaac went out to meditate in the field at eventide and lifted up his eyes and saw, and behold, the camels were coming. Remember, Isaac was still mourning the death of his mother. That makes this even more astounding. Note the place he'd come to. He came there to meditate. The place means a well of living one, or the living one, my seer. It was the place where God had met Hagar. The well where God had met Hagar. She named it, My God Seeth Me. 
He had come to this place of phenomenal revelation. Isaac met Rebekah in a place, a well of living water. Wow. And a study throughout Scripture, those Scriptures are there, you have them in your notes. And if somebody didn't get notes and wants them, let us know after we're finished, okay? Because part of the meaning is my seer, I would suggest that his meditation was prophetic. So he'd come into a prophetic place, God had brought him there. We're not told what he was meditating on, nor what he was seeing prophetically. Only that this place, this well of living water, was the place of seeing prophetically. A seer functions from a place of an open heaven. It's the highest place or the final step before functioning under the spirit of prophecy. It was from this place of an open heaven that he first saw the bride. Only by allowing God to bring us to a place of open heaven can we fully see the truths concerning the bride and recognize her. Holy Spirit introduced him. Holy Spirit is pretty important. It's quite possible that the topic of conversation between Eliezer and Rebecca was the bridegroom. All she knew about him was whatever the Holy Spirit had told her. And you know something? I know we have the Bible. But words don't do it. Only relationship does it. Because we're not clean through the logos I've read. We're clean through the word he has spoken. That's relationship. The bridegroom and the <clears throat> the bridegroom and the bride meet in a place of prophetic scene or open heaven. She covers herself with a garment and veil. It is a meeting of two unknowns brought together by the Holy Spirit. I think we need to get the mystery back. It is only after they have union that Isaac is fully comforted from the death of Sarah. Even though he was in a place of a well of living water and an open heaven, comfort did not fully come until the bride had been united. Now, I had a song here I was going to sing, but we're just going to go to the end. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this clear picture of how you seek the bride. Thank you that you sent the Holy Spirit to prepare a bride for your son. Thank you that you know the way to the son, our heavenly bridegroom. Would you bring us to a place? For we desire to go as quickly as possible, even though it means riding grace testers for an extended period of time through spiritual terrain we've never seen before. We desire to know our bridegroom. Lead us to the prophetic place of seeing that brings us to the place of union with him, we pray. In Jesus' name. And everybody say, Amen. Amen. Increase our hunger until you're the only thing we desire. Increase our revelation of you until we enter into that open heaven place. Bring us to wells of living water. Put within us wells of living water. 
and let them flow. Uncap them, Father. Uncap them, uncap them. Yes. Jesus, name yes. we pray. Yes, Father. Yes, Lord. There's some things, Holy Spirit, only you can do, but we give you permission. Thank you. Stand together.